For the past several years, I've been working as a composer of acousmatic music in surround sound, first in two and later in three dimensions. I've been fortunate enough to perform my music in a variety of venues with different speaker layouts ranging from temporary systems in conventional concert halls to purpose-built permanent installations. And like many others in the field, I've repeatedly come up against the question, how do you compose music for a wide variety of three-dimensional systems? In two dimensions, we have some standards. We have stereo, 5.1, and 7.1, and a number of variations on 8.1 used in academic music. But even these are often imperfectly adhered to because of limitations imposed by architecture, furnishing, fire regulations, and so on. And then we have 3D setups ranging from this, to this, to this, to this. And then again, you might want a binaural mix over headphones. So how do we compose music, create soundscapes and so on, in a way that is adaptable to all these spaces? Well, the most common method seems to be to construct a piece from tracks in a DAW and then use plugins or standalone software to spatialize them, either for ambisonics or for a specific speaker arrangement. And here's the problem. Even discounting the tedious process of adjusting 3D pan positions for multiple tracks every time you want to alter the mix, and the nasty business of trying to create a cloud of sounds in specific locations only to have their reverb tails follow you around the room when you adjust the pan pots, the big problem is that the software encourages us to think of space as an effect. We make a track containing multiple sounds, we put some FX on it, and then we decide where to put it. People say that space is a weak signifier compared to other musical qualities like pitch, rhythm and timbre. But this may be in part at least because the technologies we employ relegate space to the end of the compositional process. There are many sound historical reasons for working in this way, but in recent years, computing power has developed to give us techniques which could put spatial sound on a more equal footing. And what I want to do is to combine elements from two of these techniques, specifically object-based audio and object-oriented programming, to place spatial sound nearer to the start of the process. So, to start, we're all familiar with channel-based audio. You record a bunch of tracks to a disc, you mix them down to a master track, typically in stereo, and you play them over some speakers. In object-based audio, however, we can use a computer to augment the sounds we create by adding metadata so that each track or each note or sound event we create electronically carries with it details of its spatial position or its gain or other semantic information. Once we've created a scene from multiple such events, we can pass it to software that is aware of the audio system on which it is to be reproduced that renders it accordingly. And it's working with metadata at the sound event level that's of particular interest here. The other things I want to make use of are some ideas from object-oriented programming. This is a big subject and I don't want to go into a lot of detail here, but the key ideas I'm making use of are programming objects that act as containers for both properties, that's to say data which describes the object, and methods, the functions which act upon it. Objects that can be arranged hierarchically, nested like Russian dolls, and child objects that can in inherit information from their parents. And I want to combine these ideas to create a method of organising sounds or groups of sounds over time that emphasises and facilitates spatial transformations that are not always easy to achieve with sliders and pan pots. I do this using a hierarchical system of bubbles. Now, a bubble is a programming object that describes a three-dimensional spherical locus within an imagined sound space. It has a location with respect to the listener and a radius. First, let's consider the bubble at the top of our hierarchy, which describes the space in which our composition takes place. 
The centre of the bubble is coincident with the central listening position and extends for about two kilometres, which in air would mean that a sound occurring at the edge of the bubble would sound 120 dB quieter than the same sound in the centre. Now, within this, we can have some first generation child bubbles whose locations are defined with respect to the top level. And within those, we could have another generation of bubbles. And like Russian dolls, we can have bubbles within bubbles within bubbles, and each bubble can expand, contract, rotate, or move around inside its parent. Then, at the lowest level of the hierarchy, we can use programming tasks to generate sound events. These tasks could theoretically involve any form of sound generation, audio playback, or algorithmic process, as long as it produces sounds plus metadata. OK, so let's take a look at the Super Collider display. The left-hand panel represents a horizontal view of our imagined soundscape, with the listener at the centre of the crosshairs. The right-hand panel is the same, but in the vertical. And here's a bubble. It's a spherical locus, 100 metres in diameter, around the central listening position. And it has a pointer showing its orientation. So concentrating on the horizontal plot, I'm now going to add a max patch depicting eight loudspeakers showing the uh, levels that might be produced by the system in a typical surround setup. First, I'm going to populate the bubble with a number of electronic hi-hat-like sound events generated in sequence around eight points around the circle. And then by issuing a single programming command, I'm going to move this bubble from the center away in front of the listeners. All the panning positions of the events generated during this process are being calculated as they relate to their positions within the bubble itself. I can also cause the bubble to rotate about the central position, producing an interesting spirograph effect. and I can make it expand around its center. And contract. These expansions and contractions are also possible in the azimuth direction, squeezing the event into a smaller angle. I can also adjust the heading of the bubble. Expand its azimuth range again. And then anything I can do in two dimensions, I can also do in three.
And all these operations are achieved simply by moving the bubble and the complex panning and level adjustments that would be required to do this in a conventional DAW are automated within the geometry. Now let's look at some bubbles acting together. Here's a bubble containing three child bubbles currently located high above the central listening position. Each bubble has a process associated with it. The red bubble contains some sliding ceramic sounds. The blue has a sequence of four little blips and the green is producing a cloud of overlapping sound waves. As the bubble descends, notice how the image gets louder and wider. Now I'll expand and rotate the parent to further demonstrate how the children inherit its position information. I can still alter the child bubbles individually, not just in their spatial location, but also by adjusting other parameters contained in the event metadata. For example, I can reduce the event density in the red bubble, slow the tempo and pitch of the blue, and raise the pitches and densities in the green. So far, bubbles exist as object models in SuperCollider. The tasks used function at quite slow rates and the sound events they generate are static. This is to say that there are no audio rate panning operations and any sensation of motion arises from the successive generation of stationary objects. There are two obstacles to creating a system like this. Firstly, in a system like bubbles, each object-based event is effectively an instance of the software instrument used to create it. So complex mixes can produce processor loads equivalent to a very heavy channel count in a DAW. Any application that implements this approach would need to instantiate and delete the instruments on demand. And even allowing for this, some offline rendering might be required. The other challenge is that the move towards generalized object-based audio might require significant redesign of DAW applications. But perhaps the current interest in immersive sound for games, VR and cinema will stimulate the necessary move away from the recording studio paradigm. Thank you.